This episode of Corner Duty Tend to Beer is sponsored by Maui Blink, the faster, simpler, and more rewarding car insurance. Get a quote in minutes. Get car cover sorted in a blink. Success, as far as I'm concerned, is directly dependent on your relationship with failure, how you perceive it and how you can move past it. In order success, success. Shocker. The BM Cindy says, uh, What are we calling this? Take two. Take two. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, A real special edition. I think by far, top five most requested people. Oh, wow. I'm being mean, like, they left and me. They hit me. They hit me. You want that? You want Mandy? Please. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I feel utterly privileged to be invited. I'm excited to be here. I think the first thing I want you to expand now, you build, they'll come. Oh, build it and they will come. It actually comes from a movie and I think Kevin Costner was in it. <laughs> but um, essentially, a big part of my business and my foundation was built on listening to myself intuitively, like honing in and building things and trusting that I'm not the only person that is looking for this kind of space. I'm not the only person in the community that's feeling this way. So yeah, it all starts with backing myself. Um, and that's how our brands were built. You own a marketing agency? I sure do, sir. That's in fall, <laughs> but you <website>. Marketing <laughs> agency, not event specialist. No, no we are marketing agency. Um, yeah, and that was, I have to say, I was very terrified, like even going live with that site. When I started the business, I knew I was building an agency, but I was really nervous about coming out into the world and saying what type of agency. I think it's a combination of um, being scared, like, you know, can I really say this thing as a marketing agency, you know, but also more it's about what kind of opportunities I wanted and did not want to attract. Because I think once you name yourself, then people identify you in a particular way and they will fall in line. Yes. Um, and it took us, I think the site was launched last year and last year was year five of the business. And at that stage, I decided, I know we want to do it all. <laughs> we want to do it all. We don't, we have a passion for our experiences, bringing people together and building community. But moreover, you know, I'm, I have a film degree. I really want to go into, you know, writing and producing and directing films at some point. Um, it, we, I dabble in publishing, so I'm editor at large at House and Leisure. Mm. Um, there's just so many creative pursuits and manifestations, and I don't want to limit myself and, um, and the work. So we're marketing. We are, we, are we are selling things. How we are selling them, we have yet to determine. <laughs> <laughs> You go from, yo, this is a brief, please make these type of events. Yes, we're going to attract these type of people. Mm-hmm. So they're commercializing it and going on your own. How do you go about that? Because we all like, yeah, I want to host an event, but how do you actually commercialize an event? Okay, so um, we're going to speak. So the business is built in two parts. So we have our brands and then we have our agency. So the our brands speaks directly to what to the question you've raised, which is we've built these things. And we're not doing it just for our friends. You know, we want to get paid. We want to sustain ourselves from it. So after building things like based on passion and intuition, you also have to do the job of like, um, I think, fine tuning or honing them um, with certain opportunities in mind, if you will. So I think a really great example for me is Pantone's (laughs) and Day. (laughs) I really great <laughs> forward listening to that. <laughs> She's wearing a Pantel Sunday t shirt, exclusive merch, sold out. Mm, mm. Yeah, so good. Um, it's Pantone Sundays is a really great example. So I created Pantone Sundays, um, you, just personal like reasons, but moreover, I wanted to somehow meaningfully empower the fashion industry. So that's why we feature a fashion partner at every edition, etc. Um, and so really cute party that does the things that make me sleep really well at night but now how do we sustain it and I remember as part of our of my 
commercialization thinking, I had to consider who or what is the best type of sponsor for this event. And I specifically went um, looking for, I mean, alcohol partners are always the low hanging fruit. Hi, Dave. Uh, they're always a low hanging fruit, but still it has to like make sense. So I specifically went looking for a vodka or a gin uh, partner because our vodka and gins love to introduce infusions or flavors or variations and um, end up having to discontinue them uh, simply because, you know, people are not buying, but people are not buying because they part uh, part of the challenge is people don't know what the perfect service. They don't know what is the best way to have this, you know, um, vanilla vodka or this pineapple vodka. You just, everyone just likes to dash with tonic, lemonade, ginger ale, period. But, <laughs> and so, and so, and that might not be the perfect serve. So, uh, um, so that was the pitch was like, listen, I think that like a vodka gin would be great because from a color proposition, you play really nicely to our color proposition. So when we're talking, um, as we do with our vodka partner Sky, when we tell, when we invite our people to show up in red, we're actually profiling the vodka, raspberry or cherry flavor. So we consider the touch point so your first um your welcome drink there is actually the, the that specific vodka yeah. variant it's what is on special at the bar it's what all the cocktails have been built using so it's a really organic engagement with a product in a space that like it completely makes sense for the most part people have like wonder how the colors came to be the last two seasons and I'd ruefully say, oh, no, 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 it's, we were matching with the vodka. So when we're yellow, we're talking pineapple. When we were orange, we were talking the peach and so on and so forth. So when you're able to find a really good balance between, you know, what you have created and someone else's needs, you know, and their objectives and marry them together, you can create something truly sustainable and commercial. Where we find the objectives. Because I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for a sponsor. Most of these companies, they don't actually have a digital footprint or something. Yeah. Where it's like you can't go to a website and see what they're selling and, 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 and. But you'll find an Instagram page and just weird posts. Yeah. And I suppose um, there's one There is, I think sometimes as creatives, we conceptualize sponsor opportunities based on what we need. And we genuinely don't do the the work of digging deep into what often is very obvious challenges for this, for this business or for this brand, um, you know. And, and so I would just say the first thing is to ask yourself, did you really think beyond your personal need? Uh, <laughs> and, and that's the thing, you know, it's about you, you have to truly think and observe and consume and like immerse yourself as much as possible into the sponsor's world and like, you, you can suss it out. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have um, relationships with a number of the brands that um, I work with. So sometimes I like to do a, hey, let's do a coffee. And for me, like a coffee are very informal sessions for, for me to, you know, professionally meet you. Um, I remember my, my last mentor used to say to me, there's nothing more like presumptuous than when people proactively build stuff for brands. You don't know what's important to this person. In fact, it's low-key arrogant um, that you can presume to know what it is that, you know, is my objective or challenge maybe in that fiscal. Rather, just have a professional introduction, an informal one, 15, 20 minutes. And they often, I often pitch them as 15, 20 minutes, but then there's a spark and it's like an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for me, it's one is I, 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 sorry to say this, but I think often we don't, um, think past ourselves when we are, are wanting to engage sponsors. I don't think, I don't think we do. And second is, um, is setting up time just to have the conversation. People love to talk about themselves, case in point, love to talk about themselves. So. And just go hit one up and be like, tell me about the brand. Tell me what you're up to. I, I peeped this. It was super dope. What was the thinking? And then just take it from there. How do we create a unique selling point? Um, so the thing is about a USP is um, 
as a marketer, like I am, I am heavily inspired by Simon Sinek's um, Start With Why. So it's about distilling why it is that you exist. And I think when you know why you exist, you know, being able to position yourself in a way that is truly authentic to you will ultimately, you know, you'll create a unique um, selling point or proposition. What often happens is people get fixated on the what and the how, but like when you are authentically engaged in the why, man, you're able to build from a really unique perspective already because the whys are so unique to who you are and how you've been like built and framed out. Yo, sorry to interrupt this beautiful broadcast, but I have better news from the good folks at Maui. When we talk about access in the industry, we're going to talk about access in the insurance industry. This access fee actually helps you when your rainy day comes through. So always save up a bit so you don't have to access the bank for a loan. Access fees help you when you get into an accident and you have to pay for the insurer to cover all the expenses to get your car proven proper and running once again. All the expenses proper. You spoke about your previous mentor. How did you build those relationships? Because a lot of people are like, ah, what do I need mental? I have to never be. asked anyone to be my mentor. I think, and I I have had very organic mentors. They've been my um my creative directors or owners of the agencies that I worked in. I have only worked in very small studios, and I prefer to work for really small studios because. You know, you get you get your hands into so many different things. You wear lots of different hats when you are in a small studio. Today you are producing, tomorrow you're writing for coffee, the following day you're writing copy, the next day you're art directing. And it is hella stressful and, you know, and, and pressurized because you're often out of your zone, like out of your zone. But it really made me strong and confident in a lot of ways. And but moreover, it is the proximity to leadership. Mm. Like, yeah. And so, yeah, so like um pretty much very flat structures, the studios I was in. And um sometimes it doesn't work in all types of relationships, huge disclaimer. <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't have to be officially or formally um noted as a mentor or mentee relationship. You know, it's understanding what that relationship means and acting in that way. So I being, being a mentor is learning, being a mentee, sorry, is learning from a mentor. So someone who knows more than you. So I always considered myself a mentee, a mentee. I still do in a lot of ways. Like I completely abide to there's an apprenticeship phase in, in like all the time. And I, I, I move in that way. So I'm constantly asking questions. I'm an avid reader. So I'm always asking for book recommendations and I'm just constantly like engaging with people who know more than me and when the chemistry is right that mentor mentee relationship actually spills over and it, it's quite organic and I was fortunate enough that the last two um, were very organic in that in, in that way you create these households these brands mm -hmm. they start moving they start growing how do you actually measure an experience because now you do Pantone in Joburg, okay, cool, you analyze what that is, you do it in Cape Town, you do it in Dallas. How do you actually measure it? Like me measure the success? Yes. Um, so metrics of success is something <laughs> you should ideally be doing ahead. So it's like, okay, what is the financial um, metric of success for this thing? What is the impact metric of success in this thing? And so because those things become your goals. So I set goals for myself and then we have... Um, as a business, we have like at the end of each event or experience, we, we throw a good old fashioned SWOT analysis. So what were the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of this thing? We hold up our goals, which was, was our goal to be sold out, which it never is. I never have a sold out goal. It is um, quality of the community. Was it well attended is my thing. So that is not my bar. Was it well attended? Um, did we have the right kind of people, do people engage with our touch points in the way that we intended them to? And if they didn't, did we like that they, you know, respond in a different way? And, um, but yeah, so we, I constantly set goals for myself um, before I engage with the thing. How are you creating these experiences for global brands? Because global brands have a lot of red tape and then you know this, you've experienced this, you know what type of consumers are going to do this. 
It's, and the rate they want it at. Lazi, it's crazy. I have never considered that global aspect of it. I, 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 I live in Johannesburg, and therefore the Johannesburg becomes my, the world. It is my world. It is the world. I don't consider what Sky Vodka is necessarily doing in uh, New York um, or whatever. Those become considerations, obviously, as the relationships grow and the accounts grow and the responsibilities grow and as the ROIs grow. But I am a very, I operate very much in a bubble. So I don't, I really, I really don't. When we're working with, you know, global brands like Nike, sure, they will consider what Global is doing and brief us in context of how, you know, that particular brand or product is showing up in the world. But I'm like centered on, yes, but I am translating for Joburg. Mm. I am translating for King Town. I don't. So what's the role of research in all this translation? Um, research for me is for, um, for the most part, for inspiration. Uh, when, you, when you get a brief, or a good brief, rather, <laughs> when you get a good brief, I mean, it, it, it spells out the demographic, the audience, tonality, where it wants to land, and so on. And I may look at what a brand, how a brand has shown up, wherever, just for inspiration and just to also, you know, set a bar. Um, you know, part of that research shows you yeah, the quality of things of a particular thing, like uh, brand. So you don't want to, you want to keep it up. But uh, I research for inspiration. Mm. Yeah. Of all this work you do, what's your relationship with failure? Wonderful. I'm sure I failed at something this week. I'm sure I spelled a couple of things this week. Um, I have a really good relationship with failure. In fact, I think if you, if you Google me, baby. Google me. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, if you Google me, I think, um, and quotes for me, I think it would be top two, not top three, of the one thing that I always impart is um, you know, it's school fees. It, in order, success, as far as I'm concerned, is directly dependent on your relationship with failure, how you perceive it and how you can move past it. Um, I was watching this, um, this um, talk with Steve Jobs and he was talking about how he, his, him and like the people who are noteworthy made it aren't particularly like geniuses or special that much. The thing that really sticks out um, with them or for a lot of us is um, consistency. It's having the grit to, to keep showing up despite the L's. You know, it's reframing what the L's are. I'm really good at reframing. Unless I'm like, we're breaking up. I'm like, oh, so we are taking our separate ways so that we can grow and mature as individuals. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> and your delusion takes the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for real, it is, it's, it's reframing. And like when you reframe, you don't take on the, the, that came with other people's definitions of what that thing is. So I don't call it failure. I call it school fees. And already that like reframing is like different because when you call it school fees, you are reframing it as something that was an opportunity to learn from. When you call it failure, it you it's like something you have to recover from. And that's very different. That like energetically puts you in a very different frame of mind. You know, energetically what you have to do next is different and feels different. So in short, very good um, relationship with paying school fees. <laughs> Damn, okay. <laughs> so you compartmentalize the surgeon. Yes, I am very, yeah, I'm good at compartmentalizing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a few things we always ask in Ukraine experience. Yeah. We have a landmark, various landmarks in South Africa. Do you still think we need physical landmarks or can we just have events? So that come touch point. We definitely need more physical landmarks. I think that the event space, and I'm going to speak just of Johannesburg, is thriving. I think that the Johannesburg um, event space is thriving. I mean, we could always do with a little bit more variation. You know, we're overgrooved. <laughs> we are. We are really overgrooved. But I, I, I think that you know, in that um, category, we're doing the things. But, you know, sometimes you just want to go to a, a place. I'm super excited at, like, the, 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 the spaces that keep opening up, Black-owned particularly. 
that keep opening up. And I think we, we need more places that we can informally gather. And I say informally because events are what we call occasions. And in terms of just like life philosophy, I don't think that we need an occasion, um, you know, to show up as ourselves. I want to be able to just walk into a place that like exudes things I needed to exude. I don't want to have to wait for a particular event to tap into, you know, that joyful moment. I want to I wanna leave here now and go feel that stuff. I don't want to have to schedule it in or wait for an event. So, yes, we need more spaces. And then how did you export all these brands that you've created to different provinces? With money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so as part of, um, you know, understanding and aligning with the brands or partners or sponsors you get on, there'll always be a geography conversation. Brands need to have, you know, imp impact. The footprint um, is important to them. So a brand might say, you know, our footprint in Johannesburg is solid, but, you know, we're really keen on establishing a footprint um, in Cape Town and Durban. Are you the partner to help us do that? And um, I've responded authentically. And sometimes I've come to certain brands and I've said, listen, we're doing well. I think we've got Jubik on lock. Um, how do you feel about going to the coast? And they were like, actually, actually, Nandi, actually, Mama Kashaka. That's what they say. Mama Kashaka. Um, actually, um, we're very keen on showing up in Cape Town. We're very keen on showing up in Durban. I would like to show up in Kabecha. Then I'm like, whoa, we're not ready yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, I'm from Kabecha, so it's fine. But I'm like, whoa, so, like, yo, I'm not ready yet. But because I don't understand the culture and the community. And, you know, sometimes people can think just because we're doing well in specific cities, you can just drop us anywhere. And you, I haven't done the legwork. I'm not in touch with the community and the players there. But anyway, so that's how we end up moving is by mutual alignment of um, footprint and territories. And how with these brands, how do you maintain these relationships? Because sometimes we're not touching point on the water brand. We're not. <laughs> you know? we, we focus more on the vodka. How do you maintain that relationship during that season? Um, so it's, it's, God, it's a relationship. Like, and like any relationship, it is constant communication and um, a certain level of transparency and always honesty. By constant communication, I mean, we have weekly status meetings with all the brands that we work with. So we are constantly talking to each other, um, heavily agenda driven. So not just, you know, as part of that other line item, you know, we can do like a, a, um, a like a sense check of, hey, hey, how are you guys feeling? What like what, what else is happening in your world? Um, so there, there is, there is, there is that level of attention and care, um, in, in the relationships. Um, and yeah, and you know, the ones that have worked out the best for me are the ones where we are able to have very frank conversations around what the success look like and holding each other, well, not each other, holding ourselves because ourselves is like, we're in this together. Each other is very... So holding ourselves accountable to how we have shown up in relation to, you know, these definitions and these met metrics that we've put up for success. So communication, dating. So we see each other weekly. And um, yeah, yeah. And we, we really do. We have really honest conversations about, well, you know, Mama Kashaga, I don't think you did that, that well in that particular element. And then I go, oh, OK, cool. Uh, let me onboard that. <laughs> I love it. Let me onboard that and I'll get back to you. Or we, 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 we chat it through and, you know, what you want to do as a supplier, as a partner and as a collaborator is um, constantly figure out, uh, constantly be thinking about how you can be better for yourselves, for the, for the brands and for the community um, that you serve or service. What's your word to the youth? My word to the youth is, uh, is around failure. Um, failure is really about your attitude towards failure will definitely determine the altitude or lack thereof of your success. Um, and that consistency 
is key. Consistency is 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 everything. Um, when I started even Feel Good Series, or oh, there's many people who had events very similar to mine when I started, we're still around six, seven years later. You know, when I started, so I... We're better. Yeah, and, and we're better for it. We're constantly learning, constantly evolving. Um, and then, so that those will be my two pieces of advice is, you know, really check and manage and nurture your relationship with failure slash the school fees that you've got to pay, that you will inevitably pay. Um, and also, you know, consistently show up. This episode of Kuna Juden De Beer is sponsored by My Way Blink, the faster, simpler, and more rewarding car insurance. Get cover in a blink. You can get up to 50% monthly cash back when you drive less than 2.5 kilometers per month. You can also manage your cover wherever and wherever with My Way Blink. Get a code in minutes.